Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Sanj Kakar. During the COVID-19 pandemic, many elective healthcare procedures were halted or delayed as hospitals prepared to care for COVID patients. But for patients with urgent medical needs, like those awaiting an organ transplant, receiving care in a timely manner is critical. Given this, how have transplants continued during the pandemic? Joining us today is Mayo Clinic transplant surgeon, Dr. Patrick Dean. Dr. Dean, welcome to the program. Well, thank you very much, Sanj. It's my pleasure to be here to discuss this important topic. So, Dr. Dean, during the COVID-19 pandemic, how did this affect your practice and transplant surgery in general? So, our practice, like many others across the country, did slow down significantly, uh, especially in March and April of this year. Um, patients and providers alike, frankly, were concerned, uh, appropriately so, I think, about what would happen with this pandemic and whether it would be safe to have a transplant or, for that matter, any health care that wasn't absolutely emergent. So in terms of that, is, is transplant surgery considered to be elective or emergent? Uh, it's not considered to be elective. Uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services actually put out a, a statement saying that transplants were considered non-elective procedures. Um, in fact, deceased donor kidney transplantation and transplant of other organs continued throughout the, has continued throughout the pandemic. Um, many of the centers uh, in bigger metropolitan areas slowed down a bit, partly because the number of deceased donors across the country went down um, related to inavailability of testing early on, as well as just overwhelmed intensive care units with COVID patients. And there were some transplant centers that were not able to provide transplants because of their local hospital resources, whether their ICU beds were full or whether they just didn't have the manpower to do the what's usually a fairly uh, involved uh, patient care episode, especially with liver and heart transplantation and lungs. Um, however, here we haven't fortunately faced those situations and we've been able to continue our deceased donor transplants throughout. As you're well aware of the uh, transplant patients are immunosuppressed. So are uh, patients at risk for, or more risk for COVID-19? Uh, the data are somewhat limited in that area, but it's generally believed that transplant patients are uh, at increased risk of developing uh, SARS-CoV-2 infection like they might be for other viruses. We were especially worried early on about bringing our living donors in, in both the liver and the kidney world into this area. So we were able to uh, resume our living donor program in late April of this year. And essentially right now we're back to full speed, like a lot of the so-called elective practices here in Rochester. And that's been true at our sister you know, transplant programs in Jacksonville and in Phoenix. So as you mentioned about the living donor program, initially that was put on pause, but now it's back up to how it was beforehand. What else have you done differently now to keep uh, patients safe? So we recommend that all of our donor and recipient candidates adhere to the stricter versions of the CDC guidelines uh, involving social distancing, involving uh, hand washing and face coverings, especially if they, some might live in an area where the local authorities haven't been maybe as strict as other areas but we do recommend that they uh, do all of those things at home, avoid sick contacts. Here, uh, anybody that's scheduled to undergo a transplant or to donate an organ gets screened by PCR shortly before the operation. Um, and if that were to come back positive, we wouldn't proceed with the operation on either the donor or the recipient side. And the PCR test, if I'm not mistaken, is, is the more accurate test, correct? It's the test that has the most value, we think. Uh, the antibody test, we haven't been terribly enthralled with. We're not sure what that means. Um, and certainly the PCR has a very good uh, specificity for insensitivity for active uh, viral infection. And as we're learning with COVID-19, it's affecting different organ systems. So for example, uh, the kidneys. Uh, are you seeing more patients needing dialysis, uh, for example, because of COVID-19 and eventually maybe needing a transplant? Certainly we're seeing more patients uh, infected with COVID requiring dialysis in what we call the acute phase or while they're in the hospital, especially in the ICU. Um, the long-term effects of this aren't probably quite clear yet. The, we do know that patients with other infections, say uh, sepsis from a bacteria or pneumonia that require dialysis in the ICU, don't have perfect 
perfectly normal kidneys long term. And so it's not unreasonable to guess that we may see some people that have damage related to COVID that uh, ultimately require a transplant, so especially if they have other exist or coexisting conditions like hypertension or diabetes that can worsen their kidney function. And as we're learning more, um, any other organ systems that you think are being affected that may end up needing transplants from COVID-19? The biggest target of this virus uh, and the attendant pneumonias and other issues are the lungs. And there have been actually patients who have recovered from COVID infection and gone on to receive lung transplants. Um, that most, the first of those was done in the United States in Chicago, I believe. And there is some cardiac dysfunction and whether that would persist long term after the infection, that still remains to be clear though. And then the other thing that um, a lot of the practice has been doing is, is virtual visits to keep mm -hmm. the patient safe and not coming into, uh, into the, uh, the hospital. Uh, what have you been doing in your practice regarding virtual visits? Yeah, so in transplant as a whole, we were doing remote care or what's now, we weren't smart enough to call it virtual care long before, long before it was cool. Uh, for years, we've had nurse coordinators and uh, physicians provide care to patients, you know, years after transplant over the phone or more recently with the patient portal. Um, we didn't package it in a very uh, sexy way, I guess, but uh, more recently, though, we have sort of revamped our approach, especially on the new evaluations. So if somebody's interested in a kidney transplant or donating an organ, we'll do a virtual video visit with them. That gives us a couple of different uh, options, and but the biggest benefit probably is to really tailor their visit in person in Rochester to what they actually need, rather than having sort of a one-size-fits-all evaluation but we can tailor any additional testing they might need or any additional consultations. And that should, in theory, make the visit here in Rochester much more uh, efficient and they'll spend less time here, which saves them money and time off work, which are very important to the patient. Yeah, and as you said, I think that personalized touch is, is one of the unique elements uh, of care at Mayo Clinic. Uh, outside of COVID, what's new in, in transplant medicine? In recent years, especially the last couple, there's been a lot of renewed interest in what's called tolerance. So getting patients who receive a transplant off their immunosuppressive or anti-rejection drugs. Um, that's been you know, a, a, uh, the holy grail of transplant since the 1950s when transplant really started. But the, the recent uh, protocols are much more promising than we've had historically. And we have several studies ongoing here in Rochester and across the other sites that will help look at that. Uh, and the early results have been promising. And then in addition, I think one, one thing we're really interested in here, especially in Rochester, is to treat patients with obesity and renal failure uh, in a different way. Uh, as most of your listeners will know that uh, obesity is probably the number one problem in America right now. Uh, and a lot of those folks have kidney failure and diabetes for, for as a result of that. Uh, it's quite frankly a much bigger issue uh, and a longer lasting issue than our current viral issues. Um, so we're trying to take a more holistic or multidisciplinary approach to such patients. Some of these folks aren't able to get transplanted at other centers because of their BMI uh, would exceed the criteria that those centers have. Um, so our multidisciplinary approach involves really, really counseling folks on weight loss. Some may even uh, undergo bariatric surgery. And the thought is not just to minimize their risk of surgical complications or infections, those sorts of things around the time of the transplant, but really to improve their long-term outcome, to improve their diabetes, which can come back in a new kidney to improve their sleep apnea and their heart disease and their hypertension and really provide a more uh, systematic treatment for what's wrong with the patient rather than just treating one symptom. Many times kidney disease is just a symptom of the overall problem. You alluded to a little bit about the multidisciplinary approach with bariatric surgery, for example. Who are the members of that team? It's a very uh, broad team. It would include our transplant surgeons. Uh, in the near future, we'll have a one of our partners will be joining us, uh, a fellow who trained here who also trained in minimally invasive bariatric surgery uh, and is currently doing that uh, sort of practice where he is in Ohio. But the surgery is really the, like a lot of areas uh, or a lot of the diseases is really the minor part of the uh, overall treatment. 
So this team involves our, our endocrinology colleagues in nutrition, it involves psychiatrists, it involves social workers, it involves nutritionists, and our nephrologists who are very interested in this condition. So it's not just the surgery that's the important part. As with transplant in general, the surgery is generally the straightforward part. It's everything else that happens that really makes the difference. Anything else, Pat, that you'd like to uh, add or discuss about? No, I don't have anything in particular, but certainly if anyone's interested in learning more about transplantation in general or kidney or pancreas transplantation in particular, they're welcome to contact me. Uh, they can find our program on the website uh, for mayoclinic.org and we'll be happy to talk about anything. We get lots of referrals and we spend a lot of time answering questions for our patients because that's what they need. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic transplant surgeon, Dr. Patrick Dean. Thanks for being with us today. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.